Okay, this is now recording. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, we're very, very excited to host today Monu Prem. Uh, Monu is an assistant professor at the Einaudi Institute for Economics and Finance. Um, he has an outstanding publication record on different topics related to applied political economy, with, among others, focuses on the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile, on the Colombia's peace agreement, many, many other things. Um, all of these papers are extremely well published, original, creative. So we're very excited to host you here. Um, next week, quick reminder, uh, no, it's not next week, but in two weeks, as usual, we're going to have another seminar, Vera Tröger, presenting um, again, so uh, with us. So I hope you'll be here. Just a reminder that the seminar is recorded. And if you want, there may be space for informal Q&A at the end of the session. But if throughout the talk you have questions, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. Now, Monu, um, the screen's yours. You thank you. Hour. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you for the invitation and that great introduction. I think I'm very flattered. Uh, so what I'm going to present today is a joint work with Juan Vargas, who is at Universidad del Rosario in Colombia. And three of our students who are doing now post predocs, sorry, at different institutions, Miguel, Felipe, uh, and Sergio. And the paper is going to be about explosions and elections in the Colombian context. But before going to the context and what we actually do in these papers, in general, criminal groups, gangs, and related organizations use violence to achieve their goals. And when doing so, they meticulously select the target, the timing, and the type and intensity of the attacks. And one key example of this is the violence that is perpetrated to shape electoral outcomes. There is a very nice paper in the Journal of Peace Research that went across all the countries in the last decades, and they showed that in more than 70 countries during the last decades, they experienced at least one event of electoral violence but some, by some uh, illegal groups. As you might expect, these countries tend to be more um, uh, developing countries than more developed countries. But when illegal uh, armed groups uh, are doing this, they're trying to tune up the timing, the target, and the type of violence, depending on, on a strategic aim that they might have. This could be, for example, to push for some policy changes, to affect the government legitimacy, to mobilize or discourage turnout, to affect certain type of voters, and so on. However, if we are really interesting, interested in understanding what is the effect of violence on voting behavior, when looking at this strategic use of violence, it would be hard to disentangle the effect that is coming from the objective of that particular group in that particular context from the salience of violence per se. To being exposed to violence, how does that affect voting uh, behavior? And just to fix some ideas, in psychological research, a stimulus is thought to be salient if it involuntarily distorts the decision maker's decision due to its prominence or surprising nature. So what we're gonna to try to do in this paper is try to identify what is the effect of being exposed to violence per se on voting behavior, separating us from what is the strategic use of violence that is commonly used uh, in electoral violence that has been studied by previous uh, papers. When doing this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna to try to uh, use as if random uh, violent events around the elections, and I'm gonna be super specific on what I mean by that. We are going to focus on explosions of anti-personal landmines. So these are explosives that are buried under the surface. They get triggered upon contact. This means someone walking around it or stepping on top of it. And they have the objective of either killing or injuring uh, that person. They are not that good if they want to destroy a tank or a car. They're usually used to stop the advancement of people that are walking around this area. These uh, are usually used as a, as a warfare strategy to protect the strongholds or their illicit activities. They are mo they're mostly used as a defensive tactic uh, for, uh, by the guerrillas. They're not commonly used to, to affect electoral outcomes. In our case, that is not the case, and I'm going to discuss more about it. There has been a couple of uh, uh, places uh, where I heard that they have used it, but it's not very common, and you can think why it's not that common, because there is no control over the precise timing at which these explosives are going to trigger. Just for you to have an idea, there are more than 110 million of these explosives buried around the globe. These are estimates, of course, in more than 60 countries. In some ongoing conflict, there are still evidence of these uh, artifacts being used, like in Syria, in Afghanistan. And now there is evidence of these uh, artifacts being used in the war between Russia 
on Ukraine, where the UN already has stated that it's going to take decades to actually clean that territory from, from landmines. There are estimates of more than 26,000 victims every year, with a big fraction of them, more than 30% of them, being uh, children. I You're have gonna... a question for you. Go ahead. Um, can you please clarify a little bit the regulatory landscape around antipersonal mines? I thought they were forbidden. Um, yes, they are forbidden, so... but they are mostly used by guerrillas. They are not used by the army during the period that we're going to be analyzing. After the 94, they basically de uh, they demined all the landmines that were used by uh, the army. And even if they are forbidden, or the production is actually forbidden, they're still being used in several countries. And in the context of Colombia, it's easier for them to use it, given that they use a homemade landmine. So they, they are not manufactured somewhere else that they need to buy it for, for being used in the conflict in, in Colombia. They're actually homemade landmines that are even more dangerous and they are harder to, to demine. Yeah. I don't know if that answers. Yeah, it does. Your question. Thanks. Yeah, perfect. Um, so uh, as you might already expect, we are going to answer this question in the, in the case uh, of Colombia. Colombia is one of the countries most mostly affected by uh, landmines in the world, is the number one in terms of these improvised hand homemade uh, landmines that I was mentioning before, is the second one if we take any type of landmines uh, or, or of anti-personal landmines in the world. But what is going to be important for us is that democratic elections are, are actually the norm in, in Colombia. So the empirical strategy in a nutshell, and of course I'm going to dig deeper into what we actually do in terms of, of empirics in the paper, what we're going to do is to compare a voting poll. So this is not going to be about municipalities. This is the precise voting poll. Let's say it's a school that is used uh, uh, for, for people to go and vote during the, um, the election day. So we're going to be comparing a voting poll that was exposed to an explosion right before the electoral day. Let's say it's 10 to 15 days before uh, the electoral day to a voting poll where this explosion happened right after, 10 to 15 days after uh, the election. So that is the comparison that we're going to be making throughout the paper. And the idea with this is that we kind of keep fix the exposure to conflict across uh, voting polls. And the only thing that is that is changing is the timing at which these explosions actually uh, happen. What do we find using this strategy? We find that after um, in those voting polls that were exposed to an explosion before the election, there is a decrease in turnout of around 13 percentage points. That is going to be a big effect. It's between 20 to 25 percent of the average of, of the event and variable. I'm going to get back to that to that number uh, in a couple of slides. And then consistent with the story of the salience of the risk of going out because of the exposure to, to landmines going up, uh, we show that the main mechanisms uh, behind the results is related to a fear uh, story where now people are afraid to go and vote, more than a story that what explosions are doing is to, for example, uh, disrupting the, the access to the voting polls. It could be that this explosion happened very close to a road and now people cannot get to the voting poll. We're going to try to rule out that, that mechanism. And another potential mechanism that we try to rule out in the paper is that what could happen is that right after the explosion, now the army comes to this area, they start fighting against, against the guerrillas, so make this area more, more violent. And what we are observing is just an increase in violence more than what happened actually with the, with the explosion in landmines. Then among those who vote, we find that there is a large reduction in voting for the left-wing parties. And two things are important to try to understand this result. In Colombia, 99% of the landmines that are used are used by uh, the guerrillas. So it's super easy to blame who put the landmine uh, there. And the second thing is that guerrillas in Colombia tend to have a, a left wing uh, or have a left wing uh, ideology. So potentially there could be some blaming on the left wing parties because they are more associated, at least ideologically, with, with the left wing guerrillas. We find also an increase in voting uh, for uh, those parties with ties with uh, paramilitary groups. Paramilitary groups in the Colombian context are also illegal armed groups that are financed by the local or rural elites to protect themselves. And we see an increase in voting uh, for them. Then the question is where this change in voting is coming from. This could come potentially from two sources. One is that there is a, a differential decision on going to vote depending on your ideology. Once you are exposed 
to, uh, to an explosion, kind of a, a, a story of changes in the decisions to, to go and vote based, based on, on your ideology. And the other one is that people just change their political preferences once they were affected by this, by this explosion. We show suggested evidence, and of course, if you have more ideas on how to improve this part of the paper, I would be super happy to, to hear them. But we find that consistent with, with the explosions actually make it more salient, the, the cost associated with conflict in this area. We find that the decrease in, in voting for uh, the left and the increase uh, for the right is more, it's mostly driven by a change of preferences more than a differential turnout uh, based on ideology. But as I said, this is more suggestive. And if you have any ideas on this, I would be super happy to discuss them uh, later on. So the paper contributes to at least four strands of the literature. We think the first one is, is this literature on violence, on how violence affects electoral outcomes. Most of this has been trying to, to see how the targeting uh, of, uh, for example, politicians or voting polls during electoral days, how does that affect uh, voting behavior? In our context, we show how violence can have also large electoral effects, even when its deployment is random or fortuitous, and it's not related particularly with trying to affect the electoral uh, outcomes. It also connects to this literature on fear and political participation. There are a couple of papers looking at, for example, the supposedly uh, Ebola um, pandemic that it was gonna happen in the US, but it never happened, and how this affects voting behavior and also connects with this idea of past experiences uh, and uh, voting behavior. Also connects with the literature on salience. Most of it has been targeting uh, other type of questions related mostly to, to stock markets on how managers make certain decisions and so on. But in this context, we show how salience can also affect uh, electoral outcomes. And finally, this literature on the consequences of exposure to this type of landmines and also on unexploded uh, bombs uh, and there has been a, a long literature most, mostly studying the, the effect of bombing in Vietnam and how does that have long-term consequences and also kind of a new literature uh, trying to understand the effect of taking out landmines and how this can boost economic activities in these, in these areas. So let me tell you a little bit about the context. So the Colombian Civil War, as we, as we understand it nowadays, started in the 1960s with the formation of two left-wing guerrillas FARC and ELN. FARC were mostly trained in the Soviet Union, while ELN was mostly trained uh, in Cuba. As a response to this, the government basically allowed people to arm themselves and actually gave them guns in the 1970s. And that is when the paramilitary groups were, were created uh, as, a, as a way of defending themselves against, against the guerrillas. But in 1997, all these paramilitary groups, they joined forces under the AUC, the Auto Defensas, as they call it in, in, in Colombia. And this is really when the conflict escalated in Colombia, reaching now to up to 20 to 30% of the population being directly affected by conflict in, in Colombia. One of the main strategies that the guerrillas were using during this period, and the main goal of it was to secure their strongholds and to protect the illicit crops. The illicit crops of these guerrillas were uh, coca plantations, so the main input for cocaine, was to use these anti-personal landmines. And this was made extremely clear in this uh, 2008 Plan Renaissance, uh, which is the rebirth plan uh, of the of the masses of the masses 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 of the masses, and what they make super clear is that at that point the army was super super strong in 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 Colombia. The main reason behind it is that they were receiving uh, a lot of money from the U.S. Uh, from this kind of war against uh, against drugs. And the only way in which guerrillas could stop the advancement of uh, the enemy was to plant landmines. So that is not surprising now that Colombia is one of the countries highly affected by this type of, of artifacts, as I was telling you before, is the number one in terms of these improvised uh, landmines. And of course, while armed groups have tried to influence or disrupt the elections, so that is something that they have been trying to do with using different strategies, both guerrillas and also paramilitary groups, from targeting different politicians, threatening politicians, attacking on the days of elections, or uh, giving some money to certain parties and so on. There is no evidence that placing landmines was a strategy um, for doing that. In a sense, it, it would be kind of an inefficient one given that you cannot target the exact moment at which uh, they would trigger. 
I have a question on this. So if the goal of this uh, mines is mostly to secure illicit crops, I suppose there's people who are informed of where they are, in particular, the people working there. So who are, so, you suppose, are locals? So in the in in these towns, they are used for, for coca plantations. And the other one is to secure some areas for the government to pass a, and, and get to where the where the guerrillas are. The people that live in these communities have some sort of idea of where they are. But the problem with landmines in, in Colombia, given the rain and, and, the, and the landscape, is that they move around. So people have an idea that more or less there, they planted a landmine, but it's not super clear that they know the exact location. And that's why many people from the community have been exposed to this, this explosion. So a big fraction of, of the people victimized by these landmines are civilians. It's not only army members who are just passing by in these, in these communities. Okay, thanks. So in terms of data, we're gonna be using two main uh, data sets. The first one, uh, we basically geocoded all the voting polls in, in Colombia for 13 elections. So these are for presidential, for Congress and for uh, local elections. Something for you to keep in mind is that we're gonna be looking at the actual uh, voting poll and that's why we geocoded all this, uh, all this information. The voting polls are decided well in advance the election. So they are decided uh, months in advance the election. Also, if you are a voter, you need to register months in advance on where you, you are gonna vote. Of course, by default, you have your voting poll, but if you want to change to another one, you have to make that change months uh, in advance. We are gonna couple this information with uh, landmine explosions. This comes from the uh, military base, from the, from the military, where basically they have GPS, geo-reference coordinates uh, for all the explosions that happened from 2003 up to 2019. This kind of data construction comes from uh, the Ottawa Convention, where they uh, make the promise of actually getting all this data and keep the data set uh, up, to, up to speed, basically. And then once we have these two data sets, we are going to create our main data sets. And of course, some of the decisions to create these data sets, I'm going to show you that, that they are robust to different definitions. But just to, to have an idea on how this data set looks like, think of it as having a voting poll. Then I'm going to draw a, a, a circumference of, a, or a buffer of four uh, kilometers. And if there was an explosion 90 days before or 90 days after the electoral days, you're going to be in my sample. The sample is going to have a 543 polls that were affected by an explosion either 90 days before the election or 90 days after the election. They happen, they are in 173 municipalities. That is more like 16% of the municipalities in Colombia. And they were affected by 520 explosions. So as, as you can see, there could be some explosions that affect two voting polls if they are kind of close uh, to each other. In terms of explosions, that is more or less 10% of the explosions that happened between 2003 and 2019. So more or less in, in Colombia, there has been around uh, 5,500 uh, explosions during um, these years. Uh, Mono, so this is... Go for it. Yeah. So I'm thinking that before an election, there is a lot of election activity campaigning. So there are a lot more movement of people on the ground. So that directly affects which areas are treated. And after the election, I'm guessing there is less political mobilization, less movement of people, and the the samples which is in your control group is affected by the fact that now the election activity is not happening. That, that is a great point. So, so two things for that. One, I'm gonna try to show you that these voting polls are similar, not only in municipality characteristics, kind of in the municipality where they are, but also at the local level. So it doesn't seem to be that, for example, they tend to be more turnout, the one that, that were exposed to an explosion before, that, Potentially, if you think of a strategic use of campaigning, you, you would go to those places where a turnout is high, or maybe where turnout is, is lower. I don't know, that it could go both ways. Uh, but on top of that, what we see is that the distribution of the distance of the explosion to the voting poll is similar, depending on whether the explosion happened before or it happened after. So if, if the story was more of a kind of it exploded 
those that exploded were in very much around the voting the the voting poll because of the of the of the movement or campaigning you would expect that in the places where it exploded up before they would be closer to uh, to a voting poll but of course there could be something related to that but that would need to uh, yeah yeah, I mean that that is the way in which I I could I could more or less rule out the your your say. Okay, so this is the Colombia map. Uh, on the left, you can see the voting polls, and on the right, the the explosions. There are not that many voting polls in this part, nor explosions. That makes sense. That is the Amazons, so you don't have that many uh, population there that much population there. And, and here you see more explosions and of course more voting polls where, where people uh, live in these areas. So in terms, of, in terms of empirical strategy, if we would just run a regression using uh, OLS where we compare voting polls exposed to an explosion to voting polls not exposed to an explosion, of course we would have a huge omitted variable bias which is the presence of conflict, no? And in order to try to solve for that uh, issue, what we're going to estimate is a sort of regression discontinuity design, where we are going to use as running variable the day of explosion relative to the election day. So you're going to be treated in my sample if the explosion happened before uh, the election, and you're going to be in my control if the explosion happened right after the uh, election day. So something to, to, for you to keep in mind, uh, we actually did another strategy where we think of this as a sort of randomized experiment where the arrival of the explosions uh, is, is random. And this is the local randomization that, that also Cataneo uh, suggests in the case where you have regression discontinuity with a discrete uh, running variable. And, and, and we have basically more or less the same results when we use that strategy. And the other thing to keep in mind is that Given that uh, we are using a running variable that is discrete, we take to we need to take that into account when doing uh, some of the inference, and also we we use some other methods to take that into account, and I'm going to discuss them more more in detail later. But what is important as well is that in this case is different from a regression discontinuity in time, what is what is the case when you have kind of a running variable that is moving uh, across days. But also your outcome is moving across days. So, so you see some observations of your outcome that also moves when time is moving. In our context, that is a bit different because all the outcome is measured at the same point in time, which is the electoral day, which more or less solves this idea of the regression discontinuity in time that has problems because of autocorrelation in the, in the dependent variable. The equation is fairly standard, so that would be uh, the regression for, for the regression discontinuity design. We're going to have a, our outcome in an election, a municipality, and a voting poll. Uh, the treatment takes the value one if it exploded before. We're going to play with linear and quadratic polynomial. We're going to choose the optimal bandwidth using the method suggested by Calonico, but we can play around with the, with the bandwidth. I'm going to show you one figure on that. We're going to use two types of weights. The first one is triangular weighting. And you, you might think that it makes sense or not. So that's why we also use the uniform weight to be sure that the results are not coming from this. So with the triangular, we're giving more weight to the explosions that happen very close uh, to the election day. And also we put weights on the size of the voting poll. The main idea behind it is that basically we give the same weight to all the voters. But of course, I can take out these weights and unlike for us, the, the results are, are more or less similar. So if you would have to run this paper before 2018, what was the norm was to use as standard errors, ones that were clustered at the, bar, at the value of the running variable. So that was the paper suggested by Carp and Lemieux in 2008. But then this paper by Colesar and Roth came in and they showed that you should just use the robust standard errors in this context. So I'm gonna show you the results with the robust standard errors with the ones suggested by Carp and Lemieux. And also, we do one clustering the standard errors at the municipality level, thinking that there might be some correlation across uh, the errors within the same uh, municipality. So before going into results, let me go to some of the uh, things that I mentioned to, to Abura. So the first one is the distribution of the day of the explosion relative to the electoral day. On the left, you see the ones that happened before the election, the ones that happened after the election are on the right. 
And we find, even though there seems to be something a bit higher here, in general, if we run any test trying to test whether there is any difference in the distribution of, um, of the electoral day at which they, of, of the day at which they, they exploded, we cannot reject the null of, um, of, of no discontinuity in the, in the distribution. We do it using the Cataneo test. We also use this test by Franzen that basically takes into account the fact that the running variable is discrete. We can play around with the exact cutoff that we're going to use to estimate this p-value and the results uh, uh, all point into the same direction of no discontinuity. Then this is more related to, to the point made by Mayabura. Basically, here we have the, the ones on the left are the ones that happened before the election. The ones on the right are, are the ones that happened after the election. And we have the distribution of the distance of the explosion relative to the voting poll. And you can see that the distributions more or less move uh, one by one or move similarly on both sides. We can do the same test in this context. In this context, we cannot do the discrete one given that distance is, is more continuous. And uh, again, we cannot reject the null hypothesis of uh, no discontinuity. The third one, and this is more tricky on how to test, uh, is the following. So, so one threat could be the following, and it's that guerrillas plant landmines before the election in some areas, and they plant the landmines after the elections in some other areas. So at the end, we're still looking at some strategic use of landmine uh, planting before the election as a way to discourage their not and, and so on. So to deal with this, what we do is the following. We make use of the fact that in 2014, there was a ceasefire between FARC and the government. And after this ceasefire, the FARC stopped planting landmines as a way to kind of prove goodwill to the government uh, in, in the face of the negotiations that ended up in a peace agreement in 2016. If we estimate the results in both samples, kind of 2014 and, and before 2014, we find the same results. We suggest that this story of a strategic planting of landmine right before the election in some areas and right after in others, it's not a, a, a very a common, or it doesn't seem to be very a, present in our context. And then finally, uh, what we find is that we are very much balanced in terms of a bunch of characteristics, both at the voting poll level and at the municipality level. So at the voting poll, we can use all the um, outcomes in the pre-election, so the election that happened right before. And we find that there is no difference uh, across them. We can use some characteristics of these areas, for example, nighttime lights, homicides that happened two weeks before, some distances to other facilities like school, roads, the, the capital, and so on, or the type of victim that was affected by uh, the explosion. Either it was a civilian or, or an army member, and we find that there are no differences on that. We can do the same in terms of the municipality at which the voting poll was present. And uh, here, what is something that we cannot do at the voting poll, because there is no data set that is geocoded, uh, for uh, attacks or um, combat between guerrillas and the government and so on. There is no geocoded information on that in Colombia. The only thing that we know is the municipality at which they happen. So we see that they are balanced in terms of the attacks that happened in the last year, that happened in the day of election, that happened two weeks before the election, uh, and so on. And also in terms of politics based on the party affiliation of the, may of the mayor uh, and, and so on. So now going into uh, the main results. So what do we find? We find that if an explosion happened before uh, the election, there is a drop in turnout of around 13 percentage points. That is between 20 to 25 percent of the average of the dependent variable. We find the same results when looking at a quadratic polynomial. The effects tend to be larger when we use the quadratic polynomial. But in a way, it's driven by the fact that the bandwidth tend to be smaller. And I'm going to show you that the closer you get to uh, the day of the election, the larger tend to be the, the effects. And something to keep in mind is uh, that the effect seems to be big. So we find a, a drop in turnout of around uh, 12 percentage points. What we did is we check a bunch of papers looking at turnouts with different type of treatments to so try to see 
whether our effects were large or not, and they are actually large. But it makes sense given that we are looking at a very local, local effect, which is the one at the voting poll. So something that we can do is to do a back of the envelope calculation thinking about the following. How many explosions happen in a municipality on average, the ones that tend to be affected by this, by this voting poll? How big are these voting polls as compared with the size of uh, the municipality? And when doing this back of the envelope calculation, more or less an average uh, municipality that tends to be affected by, by explosions face a decrease in turnout of around one to two percentage points at the municipality there. And that is more or less comparable to what has been found in, in other uh, contexts. The usual uh, figures for, for regression discontinuity, but I think these are more interesting. So here, what I'm doing is that I'm moving around the distance of the explosion to the voting point. So four is what I use as the main distance in the main specification for here as well. And we tend to see that the effects are a bit smaller the farther away the explosion happened uh, with compared to, to, to the voting poll. We can do exactly the same with the day. So in, in square, you can see the optimal bandwidth that was selected by, by the Cataneo uh, method. And the other ones are just ones that we started to move uh, uh, around. And you can see that the effects tend to be larger the closer you get to uh, the day of the election, uh, especially for the case with the linear um, specification. Then what happens I, in terms of- Can I ask a, a question sure. here? So if I think about turnouts as just people showing up to vote, and I suppose you were saying that a large part of the effect comes, like is just highlighted in there. So part, like we could think of your story as saying, well, anti-personal minds reduce the people's exercise of their freedom of circulation, you know, basically Perfect. you're afraid you're afraid to move, but then, wouldn't it be nice to have many other outcomes? Like, for instance, if you apply the same strategy, let's say before and after uh, the opening of schools, do people then enroll less at school? You know, like all, the use of all any other measure of, of how much people are using the public space should be that, a No, that's a great point. So, so something yeah. that we are thinking of doing is, uh, and it's an art to do. I don't know if it's going to be in this paper or not. We can discuss on whether it makes sense. But... But it's to look at the exams in, in, in the uh, national test course, mm -hmm. uh, because for that, you have the exact date at which they need to take the exam. So you can see how many students show up to take the exam. And on top of that, how they perform uh, if the explosion happened before the election. We are trying to geocode all the schools now. So that is part of the work that we are, that we are doing um, to try to answer that. In terms of enrollment, the problem, and, and correct, me, correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in Colombia, you can see the enrollment, but you cannot see attendance, which is something no that, for example, that I've worked in, in, in Chile, and you can follow the exact student, whether they went to school in a particular day or not. And if I would have that, then that would be amazing as a, as, a, as a double check. Something that we do in this paper is, uh, and I'm going to show you, show you that, but it's extremely suggestive because this is using Facebook data. It's to look at whether mobility decreases after a, an explosion. But the problem is this is only from 2021 to 2022 when they release this data in the midst of the pandemic and, and so on. So, but we find a sharp decrease in, 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 in mobility right after the, the explosion. But that is, and, that is more or less the story that we have in mind. So people getting afraid and not going out uh, mm -hmm. to vote. And so it would be nice also to get a sense of how long that lasts, because nobody's demining anyway. So you're afraid to go out, but for how long? You know? Yes, no, I agree. So, I agree. Yeah. yeah, for that, I don't have a good answer. What we show is that it's, it seems to be persistent for at least a month and a half, that there is a reduction in, in, in mobility around these areas. Uh, in a couple of slides, I'm going to show you the effect of demining. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, that is way more suggestive because of course it's more targeted and so on, but, uh, but I'm gonna show you how the mining increases turnout. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. So jumping now on how people vote, we find, uh, first we wanted to understand whether they would blame the incumbent. So our first kind of prior was that they would blame the incumbent because they would say that because of them not dealing with the guerrillas is, is uh, the main reason why uh, 
these land mines are still around, or maybe they have not come to do some demining and so on. We find a negative effect in terms of voting for the incumbent, even though it's not statistically significant. Here it's kind of marginally significant, but, but it's not significant across the board. Then when looking at uh, voting for the left wing, we find a large decrease, both divided by the potential number of voters, uh, which is kind of free from this effect coming through turnout. No? And in, in the other column, we do vouchers, but in that one, you need to think that also turnout is changing. No? So the denominator uh, is, also, is also changing in, in that regression. We find a large decrease is a particularly large. When we increase the, 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 the bandwidth for the left wing, it selects a bandwidth of 11. So basically, if we move out from this, this effect tends to be smaller and more or less uh, converges to, to a point of like 10, uh, 10 percentage point decrease in left wing uh, voters. We find an increase in voting for paramilitary groups. As I was telling you before, paramilitary groups are these illegal groups that are financed usually by the elites uh, in uh, the rural elites in, in Colombia in order to defend themselves in, against the, the guerrilla. So we, we kind of think of this as an increase for demand for security in these, in these areas. And then something that we can do with our analysis is to follow this kind of media literature uh, that has become super popular. And it was made popular by this paper uh, by Fox News uh, in, in, in the US, thinking of kind of exposure to media and, and uh, changing your decision to vote. So thinking you know, about the same idea, you can have a pool of voters who wanted to vote for the left, but they were exposed to an explosion. How many of those changed the decision to vote based on this exposure to, to an explosion? We have we find a persuasion rate of around eight to six, um, eight eight point six percent in our context. That is more or less in the mid range of the persuasion rates that have been found in different papers uh, for media, and we find that smaller um, uh, persuasion rate for the case of paramilitaries. Uh, we do a bunch of. Sorry, go. Uh, I had a no. thought or mechanism on the on candidate supply. So is it the case that, let's say, left is putting up weaker candidates because they expect to lose already and some politicians are saving their career by contesting somewhere else? So can you show this, that the number of contestants don't change or the quality of candidates don't change? Uh, but but in a sense, they cannot change in the window that, they are, that I am analyzing, no? Because... Right. This explosion happened 30 days before the election where all the candidates are already uh, registered before uh, before this time. So but can so they withdraw before can... the election? Sorry? So can they with withdraw from the election, for example? That is a good question. I haven't seen it, uh, but maybe it's feasible. I, I, sh I should double check that. That Yeah, in terms of um, withdrawing, it could be. I haven't seen it as, as anecdotal evidence, but... I mean, I cannot put my hands on fire on that part. So, so maybe there are a couple of cases of that, and I, I should double check. Good point. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask also here, because this is uh, relevant to what you are saying about, usually when you have a um, so, sort of um, some kind of conflict, the narrative for political elections and the narrative for, around the conflict is are slightly separate. So when you say left wing, it might be, you know, the left wing parties that participate in elections might be completely different people and, and very um, uh, against the the uh, the guerrillas, the left wing guerrillas. Is, is that an issue? Totally. Or? I don't, I, I mean, for the, res the results are what, what they are in a sense, but I fully agree with you that it depends a bit on the period that you're looking at, uh, especially at the beginning, they tend to be more related to fact. The, the parties, but at some point with, with the conflict escalated in Colombia, they try to kind of separate themselves from uh, from the guerrillas and the, the parties, I mean. And so, yeah, but it's, the, the interesting thing is that these parties are not advocating for the guerrillas, clearly not. And so, so the voter needs to understand that the guerrillas are from the left wing and maybe they are more kind of related to these parties, but that is not something explicit during the campaign. Especially at the later years in, in or something. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. I also have a question. So, do you have information on the victims 
We and have some tips to measure that is not super detailed. Based on that, we did some text analysis to know whether it was a civilian or a, an army member. And we, we find that the results are similar across both, mm -hmm. depending on whether the explosion affected civilians or, or army members. More than that, it's, it's super hard. We, we wanted to kind of get information on whether it was a child or not yeah. and things like that, but, but we couldn't kind of clean it more than that. There were some weird cases that we found at the beginning and I was super excited because there were some explosions by monkeys that basically monkeys are walking and that those are the ones triggering, but they were not that common in order to use them for, for identification purposes. No. Thanks. So in terms of robustness, I'm not gonna show you all of them, of course, uh, but basically something that, that I think are, are important to, to think about one is that you can have potential um, affected controls in, in our sample. And what do, you, do I mean by co affected control? Is that there is a voting pole that is more or less close by to one that got treated. So that potential control could be contaminated. We try to clean for that. And as I expected, when we clean, we, we clean for that, the effects tend to be larger, which is consistent with contaminated controls kind of biasing uh, downward our, our estimate. Uh, we also play around with different type of explosions that we're going to keep, kind of both imports that just were affected by one explosion during the, the period that we are analyzing. For other cases, we, we just keep the explosion that is the closest to uh, the, the, the electoral day and so on, and we find, we find similar results when doing that. As I mentioned before, uh, this is a, a, an analysis where we have a discrete running variables. So something that is good for us is that if you think of a, a data set with 60 days around the election, we are gonna have explosions in 104 of those potential days at which the explosions would happen. So it's basically, it happened more or less at all the distribution of uh, relative days to the explosion in our sample, which is good because you, then you are not extrapolating that much, which is some, some of the problems that you get when you do this, uh, discrete uh, running variable RD. And the other one is we use this optimized RD, which was suggested by Inbens and, and Wagner in Aristat, where, where you, instead of looking at local linear regressions, which is the common with RD, you do numerical optimization to estimate uh, your parameter. And when doing that, we find very, very similar results. And finally, we also do this local randomization that I was telling you at the beginning. Instead of thinking of an RD, we think of this as an RCD, where basically with some probability, you end up in one side of uh, the, the election day or on the other one. And when we do that, we also find um, similar results. So let, let me now jump into the mechanisms. And I think we have touched a little bit on, on some of them. So, so the first idea is uh, to try to understand whether the fear to go to vote, so it's not fear of voting because they are gonna attack me on that day. What we're gonna try to push is some idea of fear to go to vote as a potential mechanism behind our result. So what we do first is to look at this um, survey data that comes from a survey that was conducted in 2017 and 2021 in Colombia, where they asked individuals whether they voted in the last election. Conditional or not having vote, they asked them whether the main reason was fear. So we're gonna have that as another dependent variable. And they asked them whether the landmine accident happened before the election, whether there was a landmine accident that happened before the election in their community. The community broadly defined. We don't know whether it's like super close, it's far. I mean, it's in, the question is just in, in the community. Good for us, this question was stated after the first one. So the first one on, on fear was asked before this. So we don't think that this fear response is contaminated by, by kind of making them think about this uh, explosion uh, episode. And of course, this is gonna be super suggestive. This is survey, we don't have a kind of random variation here. The only thing that we can do to make this analysis more comparable is that we're gonna focus on a subsample of respondents that all of them stay to be exposed to conflict victimization. This could be either the explosion that I just mentioned, or it could be because there was an attack in the community, there was some kidnapping in the community, there was some recruitment in the community, and so on. So we're gonna do one analysis in this subsample of people that state that uh, they can be victimized um, because of conflict. 
So based on this survey, what do we find? In the first four columns, I have the full sample. In the second four columns, I have those that are in this kind of sub-sample of conflict-affected people. We find in columns one and two that uh, if a person was uh, stated that, they, that there was an explosion before the election in their community, they are uh, less likely to vote in uh, the last election. And the drop is more or less in four percentage points. That is between five to seven uh, percent of uh, the dependent uh, variable, the average of the dependent variable. Then among those who stated that did not vote, there is an increase in the probability that they state fear as the main reason for not going to vote. And this effect is fairly large if we compare it with the average of the dependent variable. It's like increasing by four the, the average of a dependent variable for those who were exposed to an explosion before uh, the election. We can do exactly the same in this conflict affected sample, and we find very similar results in this sample as well. So that is one of the mecha of, of the stories that we find. The other one is what I was uh, mentioning to, to Aleli in terms of the of data on mobility. This is extremely suggestive because it's 2021 and 2022 is in the context more or less of the pandemic. Uh, it captures individual mobility using cell phones and the areas where these landmines are placed tend to be more rural areas uh, or more semi-urban areas. So, so these are not uh, big cities where there is a lot of people with these cell phones that can track mobility and so on. So when kind of overlaying this mobility with explosions, we find 36 explosions that happen within this uh, data set. And we find a decrease in mobility after an explosion. This is kind of smooth. And this is by construction because we smoothed the, the regression. I'm missing a, a figure where, where I don't smooth, smooth it. Uh, I noticed this today. I, I'm missing one, one figure when I, when I don't smooth this to make to try to see whether the, the decrease is sharp at zero or, or one or two. Um, so that is another thing sh showing that uh, fear, in this case, mobility decreases after an explosion. The other one is humanitarian demining. So we have a whole paper on humanitarian demining but looking at socioeconomic effects uh, on that, what kind of what happens in these areas after humanitarian demining. For this paper, what we're gonna do is the following. Think of kind of cutting Colombia into pieces of five by five, five by five. So, so grids of five by five of Colombia. Within each grid, I'm gonna count the number of humanitarian demining events that happen in that grid. And also I'm gonna get the average turnout in that, in that grid. So that is more or less the sample that I'm gonna be using. And, uh, and before going there, so for you to have an idea, humanitarian demining is where when NGOs, so in Colombia, the government cannot do the mining. The military do it, but they can, they only do it if they're walking on the jungle and they find a landmine, they demine it, but they cannot go and demine a, a, a town or, or a community and so on. They are not instructed to do that. So who does it in Colombia? It's these NGOs who are certified to do humanitarian demining in uh, the Colombian context. Nowadays, there are seven of them who are um, present. One of them actually is from expert combatants who are now certified to actually go out to these, to these communities and, and demand. And they do not leave these communities until, until there is no suspicion of landmine anymore. What does it mean is that they go to these communities, they talk with the community, and someone can say, I think that there was some landmines on this corner of the community. And then they have to go and check all that area. If someone else mentioned that there was another landmine present in another part of the community, they have to go and check it and so on. And when there is no suspicion anymore, they leave uh, this area. So based on this, what do we find? We find that the more number of uh, humanitarian demining that happened before the election, the higher the turnout in these, in these grids of five by five. We play around with the samples. So columns one and two are the, all the grids in, in the country. Three and four are the ones who were exposed to landmines at some point in time. And five and six are the ones that were affected by humanitarian demining and where the government knows that there is a landmine that has to be demined in the future. Okay, this comes from a census where they try to kind of map all the landmines that are around in, in Colombia. 
And more or less, the, the average number of cumulative of, of the mining that happened in a grid is between three to five. Uh, so, so you can think of an increase in the, in the turnout of around two percentage points for the average grid experiencing uh, humanitarian demand. So this again speak to this idea of if we take out the landmines, people can move more freely and now they go and participate in uh, elections. And finally, we find no heterogeneous effects by victim or by type of elections, which already speaks to this idea of just the risk of going out is what matters and not uh, who was the one affected by, by the explosion. Um, then the second mechanism is a one of access. So it could be that the landmines were placed very close to a road. There was an explosion. The road now got disrupted. You cannot go to both, basically. So for this, what we did is we have the whole map of roads in Colombia, and we can see whether the explosion happened at what, what was the closest distance between the explosion and the road. And based on that, we can run an, an heterogeneous effect in an OLS fashion, of course, and we find no heterogeneous effects based on the distance to a, to a road. We can play around using dummies at different, kind of not assuming that this, this relationship is linear, and the results most are, are, are always the same. We don't find any heterogeneous effect based on a distance to roads. We have very different definitions of road. It can be kind of main roads, all of them paved, or secondary roads, or more rural roads, and, and the results are always uh, pointing towards the same direction of access not being at least the main story behind our results. The other idea it could be that some people that are richer tend to have other means of transportation that can get them to vote, kind of their own cars, uh, instead of going by bus or walking, and maybe the richer are the ones who are less affected by this explosion. We can look at the survey and use that uh, to try to understand a bit the story, but we don't find any heterogeneous effect based on, uh, on how rich a household is. For this, we use an index of the housing quality that they, that they have. Uh, as our measure of, uh, of how rich these households are. And finally, the, the third mechanism behind it could be that explosions, what they do is that they lead to more uh, violence. So it could be that there was an explosion. Because of the explosions, the army came to town. Then they start fighting against guerrillas, and they are just making this area more, uh, more violent. And that is why we see a decrease in turnout and uh, mainly that would explain the decrease in turnout result. So for this, we use data on homicides uh, that, are, that is geocoded from 2011. So we have the exact location at which these uh, homicides happen. And for this, we can focus on explosions that happened 60 days before the election and see kind of in a time difference whether there was a change in homicides after the uh, explosion. And when doing that, we don't find uh, that is the case, even comparing within poll or without poll fixed effects. We don't find that those that right after an explosion, there is an increase in homicides in these, in these areas, which at least suggests that this is not uh, the main story. Unfortunately, in Colombia, there is no data on conflict that is geocoded. Ideally, I would do exactly the same, but with confrontations between the government or the army and, and the guerrillas, or the paramilitary and the guerrillas, but that data set doesn't exist in, in Colombia. Uh, Monu, a few more thoughts on the fear of voting. So have you, is there a scope to look at the intensive margin effect? So if a place had one or two blasts before the election as compared to having one blast or more than one blast. And second, again, so, I'm mm -hmm. thinking, sorry, go ahead. No, no, on the first one, we tried and we don't find any, any heterogeneous effect. So either the information became too salient uh, for, for everyone with just uh, one explosion, and that is the main uh, kind of story behind uh, our results. Or, yeah, I mean, that is, that is what, what we find. We, we have tried to see whether there was an heterogeneous effect based on, on how much exposure to these landmines uh, was before, and it could go in both directions because, in a sense, 
in places where explosions happen a lot, maybe people are more used to it, and this effect then should be smaller. The opposite is that when it explodes a lot, I get even more uh, fear from this, and this effect should be larger. So, so in a sense, the prediction for me wasn't a straightforward. I tried because I, I usually get this question. So, but I, but yeah, we don't find any any uh, differential effect on this dimension. But this is a great point. I mean, yeah, I, I fully agree with you. So I was thinking of another way. So maybe if the explosion led to a death versus an explosion led to a person becoming handicapped. So if that's something you can exploit to understand fear of how much is the fear. And also, can you look at if there was an explosion which happened in the last one year, and now there was another explosion right before the election. So that leads to a memory of, you know, there is a higher likelihood of explosions as compared to a place where it had an, a blast one month before, but it wasn't the case in the last one year. On the first one, uh, on the text, we don't have the actual kind of fatality of the of the of the landmine to to exploit it it's more or less 50 50 uh, so actually it's even less than 50 for a uh, mortality so for fatality and it's higher the probability that you can like lose a limb and so on the problem uh, is that at some point a uh, FARC were using poison as well in these in these uh, landmines, so that increased the fatality rate as compared with the usual landmine, uh, because just by being touched by by these of nails that they would put inside, that basically would just spread once they explode, um, the fatality rate went up uh, when they were using that uh, type of poison in, in the explosions. And the other one is a, is a good point. We we have played a little bit, but I think there is more to be done to try to understand um, the exposure, kind of the the long term exposure. On, on landmines more than just the short one, which is the main one that I answered uh, before. Yeah, I'm thinking a bit one. about memory and recall of the past yes. event mm -hmm. and that's feeding into the yeah. fear. Yes, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Perfect. Okay, so then the second part is to try to understand what could be behind this change in composition. And as I show, as I told you before, this could come potentially for, from two different sources. The first one is that there was a differential decision on going to vote based on your ideology. So let's say I'm from the left wing, there was an explosion. I changed my decision of going to vote differentially from someone that was from the right wing and was exposed to the same explosion. Okay, so that is kind of one story. The other story is that there was a change in preferences. I was exposed to an explosion. I changed my mind about which uh, party I should um, vote for in the election. So for the first one, and this is not going to be perfect. That is what I told you at the beginning. But of course, I'm super open for, for ideas on this. So the first one is using turnout as a bad control in the RDD regression on, uh, on left-wing uh, voting. So this has been done in a couple of papers before, but we know that adding bad controls in, in general is not a great idea. But in, in general, the, the hope is that when we add the bad control, that would kind of suck the part of the effect that is mediated by turnout. No, that is the main kind of theoretical idea that, that we have when we add bad controls in this regression. There is another, a little bit more sophisticated, but still needs a lot of uh, assumption, which is this G sequential estimation where you make it super explicit that turnout is the mediator. So you can estimate the kind of direct effect from explosion to left and also the mediated indirect effect that, that is coming from, from turnout. When doing both and looking at left wing voters, this is the main estimate. And these are the two other ones that we are uh, estimating. You see that there is a drop in the coefficient when adding it as a bad control or this G sequential estimation, but that more or less moves or explains like 10% of the main effect that we are finding uh, in our baseline specification, this for both paramilitary and uh, for the left uh, wing voting. So that suggests that that is not at least the main story behind it if we believe in these two stories. Something There's one minute can... left. Okay, something else that we can do is uh, use the, the ideology of the voters and do some heterogeneous effect based on that. This comes from the survey and again, we don't find any heterogeneous effect based on voters' ideology in their decision 
to go uh, to vote. So then we think that the most uh, likely mechanism behind this result is a change in preferences. So just to conclude, violence in general is not random. So when studying its consequences, it's going to be hard to disentangle the fact that it's coming from the perpetrator's objective, from uh, what actually affects people when they are exposed uh, to, to violence. In this paper, we try to overcome this by using these quasi-random explosions of, um, of landmines. We find that explosions have a large effect on voter turnout. That is mainly coming through a fear and change of voter uh, composition story that is consistent with salience of the landmines risk, distorting people's electoral uh, choices. And what I think is important to stress is that even in places that are in a phase of uh, moving into a pe more peaceful environment, these type of art artifacts are still there. So these artifacts can still distort pe the people's decision on going to vote in a more peaceful environment. In, in, and in that case, it would kind of continuously uh, affect or victimize population that has not been uh, participating in democracies. And, and this kind of shows the long-term, potentially long-term effects of exposure to these type of uh, artifacts uh, in conflict affected areas. Thank you. So uh, thanks. So please join me in uh, thanking our speaker <laughs> uh, for the talk. So I'm gonna stop the recording now. Thank you. And if, come on, stop. <laughs>